Um, this is a, a jointly authored paper um, written by myself and my colleague at University College London, uh, Alan Sieg, uh, who unfortunately can't be here, and it's a fully uh, jointly authored paper uh, with equal authorship. And the story of this research is really that, like, uh, um, we're both specialists on Central and, and Eastern Europe, and like a lot of people, um, we noticed that successful new parties in Central and Eastern Europe that were emerging um, were increasingly led by a colorful array of anti-politicians, businessmen, officials, central bankers, aristocrats, journalists. And that they were, in some respects, classically populist parties, lambasting the existing political class and the establishment as corrupt and ineffective. But at the same time, uh, that these parties lacked the ethnocentrism, illiberalism of radical right populists and the anti-capitalism of, uh, of the radical left, which was a puzzle for us. Um, and as we looked, we saw more and more of these parties, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but also increasingly, or to some extent, in Western Europe. And we feel that this is a very politically significant phenomenon uh, for democracy in Central and Eastern Europe, certainly, and perhaps also in Western Europe. And, and that's for two reasons. And the first is that these parties are on some occasions capable of making very, very major electoral breakthroughs of a far greater magnitude than uh, radical parties of the left or right. And secondly, that because of this, and because of their relative moderation on uh, social and economic and socio-cultural issues, that these parties can get into government and become governing parties either as lead parties or as uh, coalition partners. We also feel that these parties are uh, understudied. Um, they're often uh, lumped together with a variety of other uh, populist phenomena, the radical right, uh, social movements, the radical left, and it's really only the most cutting edge research which has really picked out this type of party, which are, for example, sometimes labeled centrist populist parties. They were, they were, mentioned, uh, they were mentioned yesterday. And we really feel that it's time that there was some serious uh, academic research uh, on this group of parties, if indeed they do add up to a coherent group of parties. Um, there isn't really a literature on this type of, uh, type of party. Um, when they are discussed, they are broadly explained in similar terms to other anti-establishment and populist uh, groupings uh, as, a, as a response to economic hard times, as part of a crisis of politics, dis growing distrust, relationship between citizens and politicians, or conceivably as part of the story of the decline of traditional parties, the, 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 the argument that, that uh, Peter Mayer developed uh, in, in his work, um, which we think is, um, although established parties are less, less established in Central and Eastern Europe, we still think that that argument is a potentially a relevant one. Uh, and we think it's distinct from the second uh, point about the crisis of representation, uh, trust, and um, representative uh, democracy. When we try to think about these parties, um, we shied away from the populism literature and we labeled them uh, anti-establishment reform parties. And we saw them as, re as, as combining three distinct uh, elements, as being firstly genuinely new, and my colleague Alan her, her has written extensively on this and we used an adapted version of his definition, as having the classically populist anti-establishment uh, focus, and as being what we called uh, mainstream reformist, by which we meant two things, uh, that they were programmatically non-radical as far as the economy and socio-cultural issues were concerned, and we drew on the work of uh, Kaz Muda and also uh, Luke March on the radical left to, to, to define that, and at the same time that they were politically um, reformist, and we took that uh, in quite a general way that these parties advocated some kind of political reform, either institutional or displacing uh, ineffective established elites, or even a vaguer notion of doing politics uh, differently, um, what my colleague Alan calls a, a project of uh, newness. 
Um, the reason we shied away from the populism literature, um, we, we did so for a number of, uh, a number of reasons. Um, firstly, these parties don't really fit the classic Muda definition of populism. Uh, in particular, while they stress um, the sameness of the political class, they don't really put across an image of a morally unsullied, unified, homogeneous uh, people. Uh, they are rather um, vaguer uh, than, uh, than that. And we also want to make clear that we are not proposing in any sense a, a new party type, a new model, or, or God forbid, a new party family. Uh, and we, we feel that uh, to some extent the populism literature has become a bit, um, a bit rigid, um, a bit orthodox. Um, if you're familiar with it, if you want to work within that idiom, we could call these parties centrist populist. The purpose of this paper is not to, to make uh, typological arguments, but for reasons I've explained, we preferred uh, to do that. Um, a further reason being we identified a group of parties in Central and Eastern Europe uh, at the intersection of these three characteristics, but also there are others around the edge, around the fuzzy edge, which are... Uh, <laughs> which are close to this type of party. So we wanted a, a slightly looser um, conceptualization. Um, what did interest us was why these parties succeeded electorally, why they broke through electorally, why they broke through in some contexts and not in others. And to do this kind of comparison, um, we chose a technique called uh, fuzzy set qualitative, qualitative comparative um, analysis. Um, which is a, a computer-based technique which uses um, Boolean algebra and, and set theory to mimic the process of qualitative case comparison that researchers would do uh, more intuitively with a small number of cases and, and, and causes. QCA enables us to identify causal configurations that lead to a particular, um, particular outcome or fail to produce a negative one. And its great advantage is that it enables us to deal with causal complexity. Um, and, um, and that operates at two levels. The first is that it enables us to think in terms of the way that causes interact and combine with one another. Um, there's been a tendency, it's a perfectly valid tendency, to, to be somewhat variable oriented, to ask what is the effect of economic voting? What is the effect of corruption? Um, these are good questions, they're necessary questions, but we wanted to think about the way that these causes might combine in particular pathways. Um, second advantage is that it enables us to identify when several paths lead to the same outcome, so-called equifinality. In other words, okay, let's, let's assume that these parties are a group. Um, it isn't necessarily the case that a single outcome has a single cause or set of causes. Um, Fuzzy sets, um, essentially, uh, I don't have time to go through the methodology here, but uh, we didn't, fuzzy sets, which is the uh, industry standard, if you like, for QCA these days, um, operates with the idea that a, uh, an outcome or a causal condition <coughs> can either be fully, partially, or not at all in the, um, in the set of the, of, the, of the outcome. It doesn't operate with a present or absent. Um, approach. What interested us? Um, we're, we're interested in breakthroughs, electoral breakthroughs for the, this type of party. We focused on what um, Popelichess calls third generation elections in Central and Eastern Europe. And his argument in a very uh, influential paper, an excellent paper published in World Politics, is that in Central and Eastern Europe, what he terms non conventional parties or unconventional parties will break through after the uh, parties of left and right, which formed after the fall of communism, usually based on the former ruling party and the former opposition, have both alternated in government, uh, and voters maybe have tried both of those and may be looking for alternatives. Our unit of analysis was the individual um, election. We looked at 34 uh, elections across uh, nine countries. Um, we excluded um, Romania because when we looked at levels of political competition and democratic freedom, we felt there really wasn't sufficient democratic uh, competition there. Um, in defining breakthrough, we said that really we're looking for a big electoral score of 30% of the vote or more. Um, and we defined the so-called crossover point when it's maybe more a breakthrough than not a breakthrough at, at, uh, at 7%. 
Causal conditions. Um, we, we selected five causal conditions um, which kind of echo the, the, the literature. We looked at uh, rising unemployment over the past two years, okay. economic contraction of the previous year, perceived levels of corruption, uh, and also the, whether corruption was rising or falling, and whether there'd been a history of successful new parties, which captures a certain form of electoral volatility. Um, our results. Um, we came across, we didn't find any necessary causes, unsurprisingly, given the, the, given the range of cases and causes, um, but we did find um, five, really four, sufficient paths for breakthrough, which are expressed here in the kind of classic Boolean algebra that uh, FSQCA uses, uh, which I will translate into uh, normal English. Um, the first path was a path um, of corrupt, socially painful growth, um, which covers, um, you can probably decode the country abbreviations, uh, Bulgaria in 2001, in 2009, Lithuania in 2000, and, and, other, and other cases. I interestingly, um, it's a situation where unemployment is rising, there is growth, and there is high corruption. Um, interestingly, coinciding for some cases with a period just before EU accession. A second similar path covering some but not all of the same cases. It's not uncommon to find the same cases covered by different paths in QCA, which suggests there are parallel processes. Again, a context of growth, but increasing corruption in a relatively unstable uh, party system. The third path, which covered a, a number of um, Baltic cases, was low and rising corruption, again, in economic good times. We find the low and rising corruption a very interesting context. It suggests that the voters may turn to such parties um, when corruption is suddenly seen as a problem, having not been seen as a problem before. The fourth path, um, which we could term a, a kind of central European recession path, um, is the only path which neatly groups the post-crisis cases and covers the Czech Republic in election of 2010, the Hungarian election of 2010, and Slovenia's 2011 elections. Uh, we have recession, uh, economic contraction, we have rising corruption, the two go together, and very interestingly, we have stable party systems, um, rigid party systems. And then the final path is a case, a path which only covers Latvia, and that's not particularly surprising um, given Latvia's very sharp and very brief um, recession. Um, I, I won't talk about Latvia. In terms of our, um, our solution, um, what, we, what we find, um, inevitably there are some loose ends and things that, things that don't fit. And if I present here our so-called intermediate solution, which incorporates some kind of counterfactual cases, uh, of possible combinations which, um, uh, which don't occur in, in, in real life, so-called easy counterfactuals. Um, we can't explain the case of the Pelikot movement in Poland using any of our pathways. Um, we also find that um, the, the in breakthrough of law and justice in its initial form in Poland in 2001 and the um, sort of green reformist uh, politics can be different party in Hungary in 2010, um, we, we find that these parties have lower membership in the solution. In, in other words, the parties we pick out were less successful than they should be in terms of our causal path. Interestingly, in both of these cases, there was a new and dynamic radical right force competing, uh, competing with these parties. Uh, our view of the radical right in Central and Eastern Europe is that in many countries it is moribund and a niche force, but in Poland and Hungary then there were dynamic radical right competitors. Our conclusions. Um, first of all, we think that this category of what we term anti-establishment reform parties is more than just a grab bag residual category of hard to label protest parties. We think that broad monocausal explanations that of the kind you sometimes find think tanks peddling um, are, are misconceived and that even variable a variable oriented approach needs to be complemented with an approach or with approaches which think about causal paths and how causes combine in specific groups of cases. Um, we think the debate needs to be reframed in those terms. We have some counterintuitive findings. In Central and Eastern Europe, both before and after the breaking of the crisis, these type of parties have broken through more often in economic good times than in economic bad times. There are contexts in which party system stability 
which is promoted as a, uh, or seen in the literature as a universal good, as stabilizing and consolidating democracy, has been more favorable to the breakthrough of these parties in combination with certain other conditions than party system fluidity. I am just finishing. Um, changes in perceived corruption seem to matter a lot. Um, the closest we came to a necessary condition was rising corruption. Uh, it seems to matter more uh, than, than economics in, in this context. Whether that is an actual concern about real corruption or whether, uh, whether we're really talking about corruption as a kind of metaphor for a wider anti-political malaise and discontent with representative democracy, uh, we don't know. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <coughs>